Mosmanim laod limud yashaya beyom revi be'erev. Lord, um, welcome over or hello everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday night Isaiah study. Okay, so um, last week we looked at Isaiah chapter forty-eight verses eight uh, one through seven, and tonight we're looking at Isaiah forty-eight verses eight through fourteen. And I titled the study, What to Look for When God Does Something Brand New in Our Lives. Okay, so before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could study your word. Lord, we thank you so much for your word that you have preserved for us over the centuries, Lord. And, and we ask, Lord, that tonight as we study your word, that you would speak to our hearts. You'd help us to live our lives for your glory and uh, honor and praise, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for Israel. I ask that you would help them to overcome their enemies to defeat and to destroy Hamas and Hezbollah, Lord. And I pray that you would give them victory and quickly and uh, in a miraculous way, Lord. And we just ask that you do all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so Isaiah 48 is in the major emphasis in this chapter is how God has the ability to do something brand new in the lives of his people. Okay, and you know, this is something that we should be looking for in our lives, you know, how the Lord is working something new, right? And as we study Isaiah chapter 40 through 48, we can see the continuity of these chapters with Isaiah's increasing intensity of warning to his pe people. And we see that in Isaiah chapter 40 and, and chapter 42, 43, 45, 46, and, and so forth. And so, uh, this is related to how the Lord God knows the stubbornness of a person's heart towards idolatry. And the Lord, the love of the God is also emphasized here in the repeated times that the God of Israel states that he is going to deliver his people. We notice how it was not just the love of God that caused the Lord to deliver his people, but that his name is connected to Israel, right? So, the preservation of Israel is consistent with the promises that the Lord God had made to Israel and to their fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is how and why Moshe argued the way he did in Parashat Kitisa. So I thought we would look at that tonight, okay? And, and we're in part one of the study here, the introduction. Okay, so here is Sefer Shemot, Perek Lamed Dalet. Okay, so it's the, the book of Exodus chapter 34. Okay, in verses 11 through 14. Okay, so Moshe says the following. And then what, what, what happened here is that we're in Parashat Ketisa here in chapter 34 of Exodus. And the people has sinned before God, before the mountain, making a golden calf. Okay, so Moshe goes back up the mountain and he seeks the Lord. And, and <laughs> this is how he approaches the Lord. And it says, Vaychal Moshe et okay so Moshe sought the Lord his God and said Lord why are you angry against your people which you brought out of the land of Egypt with a great uh, with great power, okay, and as that bekoach be gadol, right, with with great power, and with a, a mighty hand, okay, a very a very strong hand, okay, and it goes on, verse twelve, it says, Lama yomru mitzrayim lemor beraa hotziam leharog otam beharim. Uh, ul kalotam me al pene adama shuv me mecharon apecha ve hinachem al hara le amecha. Okay, so the, the Egyptians will say for, um, for calamity, right? For they will say for calamity that he brought them out to kill them and to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. And then he says, turn from your wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. And then in verse 
13, it goes on and says, Zechor uh, la'Avraham la'Yitzak la'Yisrael avadecha asher nishbata lachem bach vit um, vat daber alechem arbe et zaracham zaracham um, ke 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 kochavi ke kochave hashamim like the stars of the heavens, right? Vekoharetzazot asher amarti aten lezarachem venachalu leolam. Okay, so he's saying, um, Zechor, remember the fathers, right? Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Remember two. It was two Israel, two Abraham, two Isaac, and two Israel that uh, your servants to whom you swear by yourself and said to them i will multiply your seeds as the like like the stars of heaven right and um your seed as the stars of heaven or your children and all this land i've spoken of i will give to your servants um to whom i will i will give unto your your seed sorry give give unto your seed and they will inherit it forever right it'll be an inheritance forever okay and uh and then in verse 14 it says vanyinachem adonai al hara'a asher dibar la'asot la'amo and so the lord repented of the evil you know or the the calamity of which that he had spoken that he was going to do unto the people okay so here uh moshe goes before god on mount sinai and and he approaches the lord with this kind of argument on so that god would save the people of israel rather than destroy them right because of their sin of the golden calf and so the reason is that the name of god is connected and or associated with israel right and this is why all who stand against israel will be destroyed right moshe argues what will the nations think when the Lord God brings the people out into the wilderness and then they are all dead, right? They're they're all destroyed. And so Moshe speaks of the graciousness and the mercy of God. And the point is, what we see here in Isaiah 48 is how God is unlike all of the other gods of the nations. You know, our God is full of mercy and grace, right? And patience for his people. And that's what we're seeing here, right here in, in uh, Parashat Ketisa and Sefer Shemot Perak Lamed Dalet, right? And so the evidence for this is so clear, you know, not just because it is what we see in history, but because this is what is stated explicitly in the scriptures, connecting the Torah to Israel and the rest of the scriptures. We note something here about the continuity of the scriptures and the mercy and the grace of God, that the evil one does not want us to make these connections in the text you know, that, that produce faith in God, okay? The evil one wants us to believe that man earned his salvation under the Torah, and he wants to remove all of these verses from Isaiah saying that they are not authentic, and thus removing the ability to see how God has always been merciful and gracious towards his people, okay? And this is what Isaiah is speaking of, and how um, we enter into the covenant by faith, right? And, and this is why modern scholars today, if you look at the Christian scholars, that they work so hard to dismantle, to take apart, to deconstruct the book of Isaiah and to remove the significance of these things because they are so evil, easily influenced by the evil one, right? And um, we note the importance of these scriptures here, the, the weightiness of these scriptures in light of the truths that are spoken here in regards to the mercy of and the grace of God and the continuity of the scriptures from the beginning, you know, from, from the Torah, from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. You know, there is a continuity here and a truth, right, that, that God wants us to see. And, and again, you know, this is why the evil one has the scholars looking to remove all of the chapters of Isaiah from chapter 40 all the way up to chapter 66, you know, picking a piece of picking it apart and even removing entire chapters, right? And under the argument that Isaiah couldn't have been so accurate in his predictions because the scholars do not have faith that God's able to do these things, okay? So um, 
I had found in John Oswald's commentary the following comments on these verses here from Isaiah chapter 48. And so he says the following. He says that many scholars have looked at these verses as clear evidence that chapters 40 to 66 could not have been written before 545 B.C. The argument runs as follows. If the prophecy concerning Cyrus, the new things of verse 6, had been given um, in 700 B.C., it would hardly still have been a surprise. It could hardly still have been a surprise in 540 B.C. And if it was not a surprise in 540 B.C., What's the point of this whole section? You know, furthermore, in verse 7 says that the events are actually being created today, with today necessarily referring to the time of the return. Okay, taken together, the evidence is conclusive for many scholars. Okay, so the idea here is that um, that chapters 40 through 66 are to be removed because they're fake. You know, Isaiah didn't write them. Someone else wrote them. That, this is what the scholars are saying. This is what John Oswald's pointing out. And uh, when you read his commentary, and I, I give the page numbers, you can look it up. And but when you you look in the section, you read through the section, you read what he says. You know, it's what what's surprising is that John Oswald claims that this argument is impressive. Okay, and uh, I thought I I was surprised by that. I I don't think that this this argument here, this paragraph that I'm showing you, this is very impressive at all. In fact, in fact, I don't think it's impressive at all. And I'll, get, I'll tell you why, and it's because what we see going on in this world today, okay, um, we have the written scriptures, right? We've got the printing press, you know? We all can easily get a Bible and read what it says, right? And back in Isaiah's day, they didn't have the printing press. Every person didn't have the Word of God so easily accessed to, right? And so the the point is, is that they disregard in Isaiah's time, they disregard God's word as much as men today disregard God's word. You know, you take an example that this, on the scriptures, the importance of the scriptures for our for our lives today. You know, men in the church do not even know what is written in these scriptures. I'll tell you, the majority of the people who claim to have faith in Yeshua, do not even know everything that's written in the scriptures. They don't, they don't apply the scriptures to their lives. And then the idea of Cyrus being uh, known, you know, like they were, they were, like he's saying here, um, seven, remember 700 BC is going back further. It's older, right? And, and the 545 is young uh, earlier because it's, it's moving towards zero when, when Yeshua was born. And then you know, anyway, so um, the point is, is that he, the argument here is that this would have been known and it would have been no surprise. And so this whole section of Isaiah 40 to 66 was, is, is, is irrelevant. And um, the, my, my point is, is that the men in this time, and especially in 545, didn't care about God's word. They didn't have copies of God's word so that they could read it daily. They didn't know what God's word says. Why would it be a surprise? It's a, it's a poor argument. It's a very poor argument that to, to make the claim that Isaiah, Isaiah 40 through 66, the chapters 40 through 66, should just be tossed out of, out of Scripture. You know? And so um, the point is, is that what we see today is that the majority of people don't even know what the Scriptures actually say. Okay, what the what the Bible actually says, you know, and in, in our modern age where everyone can, anyone can get a Bible, you can even get them for free, and yet doesn't know what's written in Scripture. You know, um, this this is a poor argument. This is a really poor argument, and you know, uh, we see when we study the Scriptures, we look at the history, we see the issues with the people of Judah and Jerusalem in their idolatry and in their refusal to listen to the Lord. And so in light of these things, it would not be surprising at all that 150 years later, they would not know that Cyrus would function as their deliverer, you know, especially being in exile and each man not even having a copy of the word of God. You know, we note there were only a few who preserved the word of God taken to Babylon. And we have this written in the scriptures. Ezra comments on this. 
<coughs> Ezra, um, it says in Ezra that he brought with him the law of Moses, <coughs> the Torah, <coughs> and presided over it, its correct interpretation. And so um, we, we read in Ezra in chapters 4 through 6, it focuses on the rebuilding of the temple. And in Ezra's personal story begins in chapter 7 of his book. And the fact is, is that many times we don't see what's plainly written down, okay, in the scriptures. We have to read it year after year after year over and over and over again. And, and you know, examples can be taken from, like, uh, examples of this, let's, let's say, can be taken from the New Testament text, how Peter insisted that the Messiah would not die on the cross, okay, in Mark chapter 8 and chapter 9. And then later on, when the truth was revealed, <coughs> it was announced that Yeshua, was, he announced that Yeshua was handed over to the cross, okay, in Acts chapter 2. So we also note how we have in the scriptures all that, um, all of scripture is insignificant to those who do not believe, right? And so they, they see those who don't believe in the Bible, right? They they don't see any application of the Word of God to their lives, okay? So, and we think back to what was going on in Isaiah's day and in Jeremiah's day, right? Because Jeremiah is a prophet where Babylon came, you know? And so all of these things, they, they come full circle back to this concept of trusting in the God of Israel. Okay, the major thrust is <laughs> to believe that God can deliver his people in a way that they have not seen before. And then again, you know, this is Cyrus, and this is Yeshua, right, and the Messiah. And so this, this is the thrust behind the New Testament text on how the Lord brought his Messiah, Yeshua, to die for the forgiveness of sins. And we note how these things are not outside of what is written in the Torah and the scriptures and how the priest would bear the iniquity of a person and make atonement before God. You know, he would eat a portion of the of the sacrifice, bear the iniquity, and then in the with the blood he would make atonement on behalf of you. Know, he <clears throat> the priest functions as a substitutionary atonement, right? And <clears throat> we see this, for example, in Leviticus chapter ten, verse seventeen. Moshe says. Why have you not eaten the sin offering in a holy place since it is most holy? God has given it to you to bear the guilt of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. Okay, so right there is the proof text, you know, Leviticus 10, verse 17. And in this verse, in this passage, Moshe rebukes the priest who failed to eat the offering in the sanctuary. And he explains that God has granted them the responsibility to bear the guilt of the one bringing the offering and make atonement on their behalf before Hashem, right? So the act of bearing our iniquities is closely tied to the priest's role in the sacrificial process, emphasizing the significance of their actions in the, the you know, the priestly action in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. So this concept underscores the priest's unique role as an intermediary between the people and God, facilitating forgiveness and reconciliation through the sacrificial system. So by participating in the prescribed rituals, the priest symbolically carries the burden of sin, making atonement possible for each individual and for the community. And we note the parallel to what Yeshua did on our behalf and how this is connected to the context of Isaiah and, and God doing something that has not been done before. Okay, the Torah provides a rich context for and in, uh, insights into the intricate relationship between God and humanity and redemption and forgiveness and, and atonement and, and so forth. And so these passages, they offer a glimpse into the profound theological significance of the priestly duties and the servant king Messiah that is portrayed here in Isaiah chapter uh, chapters 40 through uh, 66 and in the New Testament text. Okay, so that's what I had for the introduction. <clears throat> Let's next look at the Isaiah text. <clears throat> 